Welcome to lecture five, where we're going to finally introduce you to a convention for forward kinematics that is called the Denavent Hardenberg Convention. And so really what we're doing today is we're going to have a coordinate frame on one of the joints of a robot. And then on the next joint, we're going to put another coordinate frame. And what we want to do is we want to describe where the origin of this next frame is and what its orientation is. And so for that, we're going to derive what's called the DH transformation matrix. And then by the end of this lecture, you'll know how to put all the coordinate frames like you're on this picture, this three joint RRR robot. This is out of chapters 3.1 and 3.2 of first edition of Robot Dynamics and Control. There's a lot of great resources for this, but my favorite is this YouTube video. It's, it's so important that I watch it a couple times each time I teach the course. I think you should definitely watch it a few times. There's also this nice Mathematica demonstration about the SCAR robot that you can try out. So here's that simulation. If we do our forward kinematics, then we can set the different joints. Our SCAR robot, we can translate up and down, and we can move our theta one anywhere around this rotation here, and our theta three is rotating over here. And we've got a theta four, which rotates the end effector gripper. Now they have also done their inverse kinematics and they have constrained the workspace here. So they only have a single solution inside here. So you can move around in your XY workspace and it'll automatically solve out where these joints will be. We're going to learn how to do this in class. You can also pick your Z depth that you're at and your alpha value for your final rotation. And then remember, there are multiple solutions. So even in this restricted workspace, there is the elbow up and the elbow down solutions. As we move through there, there's going to be two solutions for every point inside this workspace here. But that is this SCARA manipulator. It's a pretty little demo. But again, our big goal is to take some robot, which has a number of joints, and then assign coordinate frames to each joint. And so at the end of it, we're going to be able to go from just a picture of a robot to having the joint frames and the direction of all the movements written onto the image. So it's good to start with some definitions. Remember forward kinematics, we want to know what is the position and the orientation of the end effector if somebody tells me what all the values are for the joint variables. So those are the angle of rotational joints and the distance of movement of the prismatic joints. Later, we're going to talk about inverse kinematics, which is going back the opposite way. So somebody tells me, this is where I want the end effector at a certain position and orientation. You tell me, what should all the joint variables be in order to get there? So we have a rule that each joint is going to be only one degree of freedom. In this class, we only have two different joints. The first one is a prismatic joint that can slide back and forth. And the next one is a rotational joint that can rotate about an axis. Now, there also exist joints that have multiple degrees of freedom, such as the two degree of freedom universal joint or the spherical wrist, which we've already talked about, which has three joints that all meet at the same wrist center point. And so in this class, whenever we have multiple joints, we're just going to say that there is a zero link length between two successive joints. So we'll just put two joints and we'll have some overlapping frames. So the robot is going to have one more link than the number of joints it has. So we're going to start at link zero and joint I is going to connect links I minus one to I. Uh, when joint I moves, then this link I is going to move. And so we'll label that base frame as zero. We're going to attach a coordinate frame to each link. And so the first one is not going to move because that's link zero. It's our inertial frame. Um, but after, everybody after that is going to move. You can go online and you can find a lot of other definitions of different types of joint. In this class, we're going to limit ourselves to the first two, the revolute and the prismatic. You can try this out with your shoulder, which you can rotate and you can also pitch in two degrees of freedom. We're going to get started by deriving this matrix, which is AI, the transformation frame for link I. 
The Navent Hardenberg describes the transformation between link i minus 1 and link i. And it does this with a transformation matrix AI, which is a composition of four different actions. First, we have rotation about the current z axis by theta i. Then we have a translation along the current z axis by di. Then we have a translation around the current x axis by ri. And finally, we have a rotation about the current x axis by alpha i. So it's good practice for us to write these out to get practice with homogeneous transforms. So rotation of z about theta i, we're going to have no translation of the origin, or 0, 0, 0, and our 1 here. And then we have rotation about the z-axis. So we can put that, the z-axis in, and then everything that's left is just that rotation. So we get a c theta i, negative sine theta i, sine of theta i, and a cosine of theta i. Then we have a translation along the current z-axis. So 0, 0, 0, 1 is a translation, so we've got an identity matrix for the rotation. And then we have everything in the z, so that's 0, 0, di. Next we have a translation along the x, so Let's put these guys in again. This time it's along the x, so we'll have ri, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then the identity matrix. Finally, we have a rotation around the current x-axis. So no translation of the origin, 0, 0, 0, 1 here, and we have a rotation around the x-axis, so we can put a 1, 0, 0 there cosine of alpha i minus sine of alpha i, sine of alpha i, and cosine of alpha i. And there we've got our four translations. So what we need to do next is to multiply all these together. And so I've copied these all out, and well, let's just take our time and we'll do that. So I'm going to combine these two together, and then these two together. So I take my first row down here, I just get a cosine theta i, Take my second row and multiply it across. My second matrix, I'll take my first row and multiply it across. And my final row. Next, let's multiply these two together. It's worth you doing on your own, but you can watch me as I go through that. So I'll take my first row, and I get Next, I'll take my second row and multiply that out there. My third row, multiply that across. And then my easy row. And so what I have here is my total transformation for my link i. Now remember, either di or theta i are going to be my parameters that change. And so we will show which one is the one that changes by putting a star. So it's either going to be this, or you'll put a star on the other one, saying that this is a parameter which is not fixed. It is the link parameter that can change. And now it's time for our DH conventions. A rigid body has six degrees of freedom. However, in our dynamic Hardenberg, we only have four parameters. Those parameters, again, are theta, d, r, and alpha. 
we're going to need some constraints. We need two constraints, and that's why we have a DH constraint number one and DH number two. The first DH constraint says the axis XI is perpendicular to the axis Z0. The second DH constraint says the axis X1 intersects the axis Z0. And so let's draw out what this looks like. I've got two different coordinate frames, my zeroth and my one. And I want to show how there's this change of the origin and of the rotation of coordinate one with respect to the base frame. Our first constraint is that the axis XI, so in axis one, is perpendicular to the axis Z0. And so we can follow this all the way back here. And we can extend this out here. Where they intersect, that's got to be perpendicular. Not only that, but this x-axis also has to intersect. So it's got to hit this axis. So let's go ahead and let's draw these on. So I'm going to project this point down into the x0, y0 plane. So I've got it right over here. So the first thing we do is a rotation about this z-axis. So we're going to rotate over here. That distance that we rotate is theta 1. And then we're going to translate up the z-axis from this origin all the way to the intersection point here. And that distance here is di. And then we have a translation from this point all the way over to the origin of the next frame. That distance is r, ri. And then we have a rotation about this z-axis. So I'm going to take this z-axis that I have over here. And I'll put that over here so we can see that. You know, this is the translated z0. And that rotation that we do about here is going to be the alpha, alpha i. And so here we've drawn in our constraints. And so you can see I've got one, two, three, four parameters that describe the origin of this coordinate frame and its orientation. Next we need to talk about our angle convention for how to describe these angles. Remember we've got our previous frame and our x1 intersects that and is also perpendicular to our previous z-axis. So we can translate this z-axis forward to here. So I've just translated that forward. And our positive axis is from the previous z to the current z. And so we're going to around the current x. And so this angle right here, that is alpha i. And you can think of that as a right-handed rule. We're going from z i minus 1 to z i about x i. So next one, I've got my x-axis, and remember, it intersects my z-axis somewhere. But how do I go from my previous xi minus 1 to my current xi? And so that rotation that I do there about this axis from here to line up here, that is my theta i. Theta i is about zi minus 1 from xi minus 1 to xi. So I've got this rotation that comes through here. And so those are my notations for which direction is positive rotation. So what the dynamic hardenberg convention is, it's a, it's a series of steps that you can take to establish where your frames are. In there, there's going to be nine steps, and let's just walk through them. The first step is we have to tell where the base frame is. So what we're going to do is locate and label the joint axis all the way from z0 up to zn minus 1. Remember, we know what these are because these are either rotational or prismatic. And so we can just label these joints where the rotational joints are. We know that that z-axis is going through them. And then we've got a z-axis that's parallel to any prismatic joints. Our second step is we need to establish the base frame. And so we set the origin anywhere. And these are fun things because you can pick your DH parameters to minimize the complexity of the matrix. So you can place that origin anywhere on the Z0 axis. 
So origin can be anywhere along the z0 axis, and then we can pick where to place the x0 and the y0 axis. In fact, we can choose them conveniently to form a right-handed frame. So that's the key part. It has to be right-handed frame, but we can put that origin in the direction of x0 wherever we want along that z0 axis. And now we get into a loop that we do for every subsequent joint. Step three is to locate the origin oi. And so what we have is we've got our two axes, zi and zi minus one. We'll take those two axes, and anytime you have two lines, there's always a common normal. And so we find that common normal, and where that common normal intersects zi, that's our origin. The first one is if the zi and the zi minus one intersect, then their common normal is gonna have zero length. And so we're gonna locate this oi at that intersection. Our other option is if the zi and zi minus one are parallel, then they have an infinite number of common normals. So we're just gonna locate it at a convenient position that can minimize the number of dh parameters we have. There's some freedom in that one. Our step four, we need to establish which direction xi is. We don't have freedom in like that. It's gotta be along the common normal between the zi minus one and zi, and it's gotta go through that origin point that we just described in step three. Now, if zi minus one and zi intersect, then we just go in the direction that's normal to the zi minus one, zi plane. So I can draw that over here. I've got these two axes, zi and zi minus one. Well then, normal to this frame, we're gonna have our x value. And then finally, step five, we're gonna establish where yi is. Again, there's no freedom in here. If you have your origin or i and your xi, then we just need to construct a right-hand frame. And then step six, we're gonna establish where the end effector frame is. And there's two options. If it's a revolute joint, then commonly we set the zn axis parallel to the previous z-axis. And we put the origin conveniently. You know, do you want your origin to be in the middle of your gripper or do you want it along the tip of the gripper? And then we set, usually set our y direction, the direction of gripper closure. And then our xi is not free because it's just given by the cross product. If it's not a simple gripper, then we can again just set it conveniently to form a right-handed frame. Typically what I'll do in the exams is I will tell you where this last frame is because there is some freedom in building this and it's difficult to grade when there's so many options that are possible. Okay, now we're ready for step seven where we're gonna build a table of all the parameters. This first parameter here is the distance along xi. And so this is from the intersection of the previous axis to the current x-axis. My radial distance that I'm rotating, so that's ri. The next one is the distance that I'm translating up along my previous z-axis from my previous origin to the intersection of my xi with this axis. And so this is my di, how much I translate up that z-axis. If that joint i is prismatic, then d is a variable. So we'd write di star, showing that it's variable. Next, I have the angle from zi minus one to zi measured about my x-axis. So this is my twist, which we show by alpha i. And then finally, the angle from my current x-axis to x-axis measured about my previous z-axis. This is how much I'm rotating. That's theta i. If this joint is revolute, then theta i is variable, and we'll show that with theta i star. My penultimate step is to form the homogeneous transformation matrices AI, and what we do is we just substitute the above parameters in that AI that we built, and that's why we wrote that all out. You can now write that in your crib sheet, and that's what we're gonna use every time to build these. Finally, we're gonna multiply all of our transformation matrices for each joint to make one massive transformation matrix, which tells us where the nth frame is according to the base frame. It fixes the position orientation of the tool frame. So this T is a tool frame, but it's in the base coordinates because it's in the zeroth frame. 